Hey guys, it's phase one once again with another video of Inside Star Citizen River's Edge. This is the very first episode of 2021 and I'm quite excited to see and I hope you, hopefully you guys are as well. Now, I'm going to be reacting to it. Haven't seen it yet. Just wanted to wait for you guys. That way we can watch it all together. All right. If you're new to this channel, you haven't subscribed already, make sure you do. I'm also on all the different social media platforms, including Twitch which is all down below um that's twitch instagram twitter make sure you go ahead and, and uh, follow me there as well all right without any further ado let's get into it in star citizen we have many of these huge intricate planets and the way that we've been able to do that is instead of storing each vertice of the planet like you would in a traditional level editor, we store height maps and other data about the planet and then build chunks of the planet around the player. But it did introduce the problem of us not being able to edit individual vertices of the terrain. That is where the terrain modification system comes in. So the terrain modification system works by placing modifiers across the planet. And when we build each chunk of the terrain, we check to see if any of the vertices intercept one of our bounding boxes and if we do that modifier applies a function to the z coordinate of that vertice to offset it to a specific place that we choose so for example okay. we've got here a smoothing area we can move this around we can see that it is smoothing out the ground we can raise it or lower it we can change its size oh ah, so that's on. cool and it's similar to the, the, crater, the sim games flip and turn into a push pull we can change the scale and so on and that's all nice, happening nice, by nice, intercepting nice. the mesh building system and applying offsets based on a function to each vertex within that box. We can use this on any scale we like. So from a very small scale like this to a much bigger scale like this over here. So if I decide Ooh. I want to place my, my outpost over here, the first thing I do is I put a smoothing area down. I integrate that into the terrain so that it looks good I can play with all the different settings to tweak the roll off and the radius of the smoothing area and then I can go in and I can put my outpost down and we can see that, that is cool man very flat there's no clipping look how look, look how easy that was for him to do it I remember back in the day when they were still building out this all the systems they were saying that they need to build the internal system that would allow them to efficiently build out the system this is one of them right um just imagine this guy just this within a few clicks he put an outpost on the planet just like that everything is built out for him and uh it's just so easy and now i'm glad that they did do it the right way instead of trying to give us what we want at the time that we want it they decided to take the time and, and build out the right the systems the right way and now we're starting to see the end results of it right and this is just not just this but there's other systems in the game sometimes some of them we don't even know about um that is allowing them to really produce um at the at the rate that they're they're producing now and this is just showing us a snippet of how they're going to be able to generate all the star systems in the future as well so i'm quite excited to see uh, more about this and it all looks very natural and embedded instead of kind of like terrain clipping over the sides of the landing pads so we can integrate our smoothing areas even more in with the terrain by using a noisy edge instead of just having a perfectly spherical one so this smoothing area here has a noise function applied to its radius so we get this kind of like crinkly effect and when i embed that into the That's ground cool. we don't see an obvious circle around where our outpost is instead we get more natural looking crinkle around the edge oh of okay that's cool area. the reason really that we have cool. both of these modifiers is sometimes you want to make it clear that humanity has come and shaped the terrain to be a certain way and sometimes you just want the convenience of flat ground without it looking like it's been bulldozed by a great big group of jcbs that is so using cool. the that same is cool, modification too. system we can actually add water meshes to the vertexes the first thing I did on this was a way to place river paths because you can't start modifying the terrain before you know where the water is going to flow. So I've got this river placement tool here where we're going to be able to essentially start off by placing a spring or somewhere where the water might come out of the ground. So I'm going to place that here. 
and you can see that it automatically starts working out the path of where the water will that flow. That is cool, man. The way that so it, it procedurally generates this path. It looks the direction bro. that the water is coming from. It takes a step in that direction and works out an arc of points. And then it chooses the point on that arc that is the lowest, moves there, and then continues on to the next step until you get this nice flowing path. Now, over here, we've got a white dot, and that is because the lowest point on the arc was in fact higher than the water started with. And if you look at a river, you'll notice water doesn't travel up. So here, the point is white because we're going to have to erode down the path under here for the water to have traveled to this point. We can't have it flow up on the terrain. So once we're happy with our river path, we can look at adding any contributing springs. So for example, we might have a bit more water flow coming from there, or I might choose to have a bit more water flow coming from there. And then we can score and clean the rivers. That what is this cool. does is it works out a more detailed path between the nodes really that nice. the river is going to take. And it also works out how much water is going to be passing through each point. So you see, if I click on this node here, we can see the size is five. If I go a little bit downstream, where there's going to be more rainwater collecting into the stream, the size is 17, and that will increase all the way. That's down quite to impressive. The it's like they really, they Once really thought the this out. As a whole, they really thought this through. The geometry modifiers. Now, the first thing this is going to do is we've placed some brown decals down to show that the terrain has changed, and we've actually modified the terrain to show the path of the river. As you can see, if I just turn these off. As you can see, we've got a deep trench where the river is flowing and then banks around the river. But usually rivers have water, so let's add in some water. Cool. Now, obviously, this is work in progress. This is just using the sea mesh, but it just to prove the concept that we can have water in the basis of our rivers. But it still doesn't look quite right. If you look at a river in the wild going through any ecosystem, whether it be a forest or some fields or a desert, you'll notice that the terrain around it is different and that's because the water influences the ecosystem. We get more vegetation and growth around places where there are water. So in order to make this look as convincing as possible, we're going to experiment with adding more foliage and more ecosystem changes around the rivers. So this is just a programmer's take on this and no artists have had any say in what I'm doing here. So by borrowing a slightly more lush preset from a different planet, we can see that we can create this really effective look around the rivers with far more... Yeah, even though ground cover, artists haven't started working really on this yet, it looks really good with even what the, the, the sample that is giving us here. Through the hills it looks really good. So now that we've added in this ecosystem around the river, it really sells and looks like a river flowing through the hills of Microtech. This looks much more like something that's been here for thousands of years instead of just a bit of water that's trickling down some hills. Obviously, that when the true. artists take a pass at this, they'll be able to get some much more suitable foliage and vegetation instead of having this awkward merge between snowy trees and beautiful lush foliage. But the fact that we've got the tools to do this and we can do it procedurally just with a few clicks means that these rivers could be cropping up soon on the planet. As a reminder, this is a working prototype, not a finished product, and these are all engineer art choices rather than artist art choices. I can imagine someone screaming at me for the fact that we've got some beautiful kind of tropical trees here wow. versus some snowy pines. That looks background. good, man. This but looks really good, even though this is where they're, they're, they're still working on it. This is quite impressive. I can imagine what the community is going to be able to do with this, do with rivers and Man, just to imagine the videos I'm going to be putting out with these. This is going to be really good. Yeah. I'm going to the do some really nice videos with these rivers, man. <laughs> one more way the Planet Tech team continues to create new technologies that help our artists and designers create assets for the Star Citizen universe better and more quickly than ever before. Now, citizens that have been around for a while know that January is planning season where developers get together, review the lessons of the year before, and plan out their efforts for the one ahead. Now, by the time that this airs, that process is still in full swing for many teams, but we took the opportunity to chat with some of the folks that participated in this year's Combat Summit to get a sense of where their conversations went 
and check in before they go heads down and the process of prototyping begins. So the theme of this year's Combat Summit was really how we give the player control over all the systemic features we have in the game. What we want is an environment where things make sense. That choice allows players to approach different missions in different scenarios in different ways, and even the same scenario in different ways, which really expands the feel and the options players have. The main reason why we created a Combat Summit was to include more people from multiple departments of the company that have a stake or an interest in space combat. It helps like gather outside data into one kind of uh, focus point. We can kind of figure out the core problems that we have and also, you know, to kind of come up with solutions for those problems. It's very important to, to go away and, and come up with different solutions, test them out, see which ones are fun, see which ones play well with other features. Since last year's summit was so successful, we're really we're in a good position to go forward into this year's summit. Building upon the work we did in the last one. In this year's combat summit, we talked a lot about combat geometry, uh, which is how ships fly around each other during combat, how they're going to fight each other. One of the ways we wanted to improve the current flight model was with the addition of capacitors, which will make the actions players take during a dogfight more meaningful and uh, have more of an impact on what they see and what they do. And yeah, so I'm, I'm actually excited about that. The the um, once they finally get in the capacitors into the in the, the gameplay of ship systems, um, I think it's going to be quite interesting because at that point, then it's very important on what ships you're using for any particular situation, right? So you need to make sure that you can't just use a Vanguard and 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 handle every scenario there, right? So it, it's there are going to be scenarios where it's important to use a fighter, and there's a scenario where you can it's important to use a, a, a much larger combat ship. So it's uh it's going to be exciting to see because when they start doing this and the, you have uh capacity limitations of a capacitor then it's important to know the capability of your ship this way you can put yourself in a more advantageous uh, uh, uh position when in combat against another op opponent right so it's i think it's it's, it's going to be interesting once capacitors come into come online capacitors really do that by sort of capping some of the behaviors as well as giving right, you an right. instant visual result and instant flight result. We went into weapons and different behaviors to weapons and how they interact with shields and ballistic armor. We're not aiming for like a meta build gameplay, right? We want each weapon to feel different and to have a different role in space combat. And then to add to this, we're discussing how we kind of move the roles forward on the ships and make the most of the features that we have to, you know, kind of realize the roles on ships and for those to mean more in the PU, you know, as far as what choices you make of what ship you want. I'm very excited to... Yeah, I, I think it's quite important um, with, with ships to have roles for particular ships, right? I think especially when um, orgs are fighting in game it's going to be important to plan out um your, your squadrons to make sure everybody's is is on the same page when it comes to um fighting you know what i mean when it comes to combat you need to make sure your snipers are are, are, are in the back and well protected your torpedo boats are in the back your polarises are in the back you need to make sure that your brawlers like your hammerheads is just in the heat of the battle right there in the front um, with, with with the best shields, with the best armor. You need to make sure your fighters are also there to defend the snipers as well as to engage the enemy's um, uh, snipers as well. So it's it's going to be interesting once they, they have, they really implement um, this, this role um, thing that they're trying to get into the game. It's going to be exciting. You can't just take one ship and just say, say that you're, you're, you're going to be able to handle any particular situation and I think it's quite it's quite uh, interesting to see I'm excited to see more about it and to get those feelings of those ships so that you know 
without looking at the label of the ship that you're definitely in something like a light fighter. We're just focusing on how to make those roles mean more to the player so they can make more meaningful, informed decisions. So it was a really important discussion on those things and they all kind of relate to one another and we have to move them together forward um, in one kind of you know, line really because that gives us the best kind of maneuverability moving forward to understand really the impact of these changes as well. So now we have a big bunch of work in front of us, right? We have action points, what we want to do. So the next step for us is prototyping. A big risk when you prototype in several solutions is the fact that one might not fit with another solution. What we cannot tell right away, which of these measures are going to work and which won't. So when we're testing, it's very important that we're testing all these That is so together. cool. Combat so at the Lagrange point um, with the space together. clouds. That's cool, man. Now we'll learn more about the resulting new features that arise from the Combat Summit throughout the remainder of this year as they're being developed. So uh, Jack, can I you... show you one more thing that I've been messing around with? Uh, sure, Will. But just uh, don't get me in trouble. <laughs> uh, so here I've put together our grenade launcher with a crater modifier just to see what we could do with this. And now when I fire a grenade launcher, we get a nice <laughs> little dent in the terrain That's cool. where I fired it. We can essentially go and create some craters. Obviously, this is this is me messing around. This isn't something that's in game. That is cool. Just something that I've been. That's having interesting. A bit of fun with. Sliding and isn't in the game yet, but we'll I think in this build future, that he's using, no, no promises. This there's sliding no in there. So All right, so I think this? that's. I think they're trying to sneak in a, a, a little Easter egg here, right? There, Jared is so smart. You know what he's doing? He's showing us one of the things that we can expect from base building. I think they're not making promises and all that, but I think they want to have something like this, like to be able to modify the terrain when it when they when base buildings finally start to come online, right? Because of course, when you want to build a base. You're not going to find a perfect piece of land where everything is all flat, right? So they're going to give us an, an ability to be able to at least flatten it or, you know, similar to what they were showing earlier when they were doing the river um, uh, piece. And uh, yeah, so I'm quite, I'm, it, it looks it looks good, man. I think they're trying to sneak in a quick Easter egg without even telling us. But uh, uh, yeah, so if you're if there's anything in this video that you like, make sure you you leave a like and leave it in the comments below what you think about this episode. And uh, if you haven't already, if you haven't already subscribed, make sure you subscribe. And um, I have my all my social media links, Twitter, t um, Instagram, Twitch as well. Please go over there and follow me as well. All right. And uh, I will see you on the next one.